Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome all of you to our next session of the APDR National Virtual Noon Conference Series. My name is Dr. Hart Beatty. I'm the chair of the Education Committee for the APDR and the Neuroradiology Fellowship Director at Boston University. I'd like to welcome all of our attendees uh, for our third of uh, our last three sessions. And we are delighted to have two amazing educators again uh, and very grateful uh, to have them in today's session. I'll introduce them in a moment, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, as you know, the webinar is being recorded and it is hosted under the APDR YouTube channel to view on demand for free. Uh, the webinar questions uh, and comments are also being recorded. Uh, in addition, your microphones are being muted as attendees uh, to ensure optimal quality for the participants. And if you do have questions for our presenters, we ask that you use the Q&A tool in the Zoom platform for any questions that you have and we will make uh, our best efforts to get to those. I'd love to introduce our great speakers for today. Uh, we have Dr. Pfefferman uh, from NYU Grossman School of Medicine, uh, NYU Langone Health, Associate Professor of Radiology and Vice Chair of Education. Uh, she'll be speaking on non-traumatic pediatric GU emergencies, followed by Dr. Narsheth, Assistant Professor of Radiology uh, at George Washington University, Pediatric Radiology Fellowship Director as well at Children's National Hospital in DC. Uh, Dr. Sheth will be speaking on benign pediatric bone lesions. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Pfefferman. I'll stop sharing my screen and invite Dr. Pfefferman to share her screen and begin her presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So um, I'm Nancy Pfefferman, uh, and uh, I am the, um, the actually also the section chief of pediatric radiology at NYU Grossman School of Medicine. And um, this afternoon, I'll be discussing imaging of pediatric non-traumatic GU emergencies. So during the next 30 minutes, we'll review the common and uncommon GU pathology that can present emergently in children. In males, the common presentation is scrotal pain and swelling, and in females, acute pelvic pain. We'll discuss the ultrasound imaging evaluation and findings of the entities that can present this way. We'll start with the male uh, GU emergencies. Again, the clinical presentation is commonly scrotal pain and swelling. The common uh, entities that can cause scrotal pain and swelling are testicular torsion, both acute and late, torsion of the appendix testes, epididymitis, incarcerated inguinal hernia, and acute idiopathic scrotal edema. So we'll start with testicular torsion. Uh, the incidence uh, of testicular torsion is about 14 to 31% in children who present with acute scrotal pain. This is usually uh, secondary or associated with the bell clapper deformity, which is a congenital abnormality where the tunica vaginalis inserts abnormally high on the spermatic cord, preventing fixation of the testis to the scrotal wall. This allows for the testis to rotate freely on its vascular pedicle and hence potentially cause vascular occlusion. Complete partial and intermittent testicular torsion require rapid diagnosis and treatment uh, that's required to salvage the testicle. And the salvage rates are reported to be near 100% if testicular flow is reestablished within six hours. That drops to about 70% between six and 12 hours, and then less than 10% after 24 hours. So timely diagnosis is important. With complete testicular torsion, the ultrasound um, grayscale findings really depend on the duration of the uh, vascular compromise. In the early phases of complete testicular torsion, the grayscale findings are actually non-existent or normal. Uh, for example, in this patient um, who presented with right testicular pain, um, the testicles are really symmetric in both size and echo texture. One interesting uh, finding that is it's somewhat subtle is that <clears throat> the uh, torse uh, testicle can actually assume an abnormal orientation within the scrotal sac. If you look at these images uh, labeled left testicle sag, <clears throat> excuse me, and left testicle transverse, you'll notice that if in fact the labeling is correct, when we look at the image that's labeled sag, it actually looks like a transverse image, and the image that's labeled transverse actually looks like a sagittal image. Um, this is a subtle finding in a patient who presents with left testicular pain. You want to be thinking perhaps that this might be a torsion. Color Doppler interrogation is really um, where the, quote, money is at, right? That's going to be your, um, your, your key way of making the diagnosis. And on Color Doppler, patients with 
uh, complete testicular torsion will have asymmetric uh, de decreased, significantly decreased or absent flow in the symptomatic testicle as we see in this patient who presented with left uh, scrotal pain and swelling, color Doppler shows no flow within that left testicle. When we look at the, uh, the transverse view, this is a nice way of comparing uh, the two testicles with um, uh, the reference of your Doppler settings being, um, being the same. Uh, sensitivity is uh, for color Doppler is 90% and specificity 100% for testicular torsion. As the symptoms um, progress, the duration of occlusion progresses, the grayscale findings um, begin to become more apparent. The torus testicle becomes enlarged, uh, and that is secondary to the edema. The testicle also takes on a, a heterogeneous echo texture, again, related to the edema. When we look at color Doppler in this patient with right scrotal pain and swelling, we see that in addition to the enlarged uh, testicle with heterogeneous echo texture, we have significantly diminished flow uh, in this patient with complete testicular torsion. So now partial testicular torsion occurs when the degree of spermatic cord twist is less than 450 degrees, allowing some residual perfusion to that testicle. This can be a very uh, subtle and um, challenging diagnosis uh, because sometimes if you see flow um, in both testicles, uh, you immediately feel like there's no torsion. Uh, the grayscale findings in this uh, patient who presented with right testicular pain, normal grayscale findings, we look at the color Doppler image and we see very subtle decreased flow on the right. When you detect this, you want to look for the, the, the actual twisted spermatic cord. And oftentimes we'll find this uh, in the superior aspect of the scrotal sac adjacent to the uh, affected testicle. And in this patient, you can see this um, mass-like structure in the superior aspect of the right scrotal sac. Um, it sort of has these um, hypoechoic um, curvilinear structures. We put color Doppler on, we see that these are actually vessels and they have what's called the whirlpool sign or whirlpool appearance. These are the, this is the cord, it's twisted and these are the vessels within the cord that are twisted. Intermittent testicular torsion presents with sudden onset of unilateral scrotal pain, often of short duration. And that's because the torsion that's occurring then detorses. And these often will have, um, for the patient, there may be repeat episodes, uh, again, intermittent. So the diagnosis becomes more challenging, both clinically and sonographically. Patient may appear in the ED with acute uh, scrotal pain. By the time they get to ultrasound, the pain has resolved, and so, and there may be no sonographic findings. So, this is um, a diagnosis that you want to have in the back of your mind when a patient um, presents with acute testicular pain. Uh, color Doppler um, flow may even be normal when the patient is up in ultrasound. And so, we'll take a little bit closer look. How do you make this diagnosis? What do you want to look for? So, patients who have intermittent testicular torsion will often, again, have twisting of that spermatic cord. It's twisting and untwisting, um, but the spermatic cord, again, may be seen in the uh, superior aspect of the scrotal sac. And what you'll see, how do you identify this, this spermatic cord? It's an oval-shaped mass with a very heterogeneous echo texture, and that reflects the edematous boggy cord. This has been referred to as a pseudomass because it's not actually a mass, but rather just a, the um, the spermatic cord itself twisted um, and, and um, sitting in the scrotal sac. This has often been um, confused with or likened to an inflamed epididymis. And so um, that misdiagnosis is not uncommon. When you put color Doppler on, again, you can see that these uh, hypoechoic areas actually represent the vessels within the spermatic cord. They have a sort of twisted appearance. Uh, another example, we can see some of the uh, the vessels within the cord twisted. So testicular detorsion, those patients come up, they, they torse, they detorse. How, how can we make that diagnosis or are there any clues to make that diagnosis? If you look at the, um, the spectral waveform analysis or the, the spectral tracing, uh, sometimes there's a clue because patients that have detorsion may demonstrate increased flow in the testicle and the peritesticular soft tissues secondary to reactive hyperemia. This was a patient who had presented with to the ED with left testicular pain, 
Um, by the time he got upstairs uh, to ultrasound, the pain had resolved. Uh, flow was normal, everything was normal. But when you look at the peak systolic flow on the left side, that was the symptomatic side initially, the peak systolic flow is 0.05 meters per second. Compare that to the right asymptomatic right testicle, we have a peak systolic of 0.025 meters per second. Now, bear in mind that this assumes that you're not changing any of your um, Doppler settings when you do these tracings, because otherwise you could um, falsely um, change the appearance of the peak systolic flow. Now, late testicular torsion, unfortunately, this is um, otherwise known as a missed torsion. Uh, this is where the uh, ischemia has now um, become irreversible and, and the testicle is, is basically infarcted. Um, the grayscale findings here are, are quite evident. We see that there's a very heterogeneous echo texture. There's a uh, linear hypoechoic spoke wheel appearance um, within the testicular parenchyma here. Um, this reflects the ischemic change and the breakdown of the testicular parenchyma. Uh, there may be a complex hydrocele as well with these patients. Uh, we also see significant hyperemia in the paratesticular soft tissues and the scrotal wall. Uh, no flow within the testicle. Um, again, this um, hyperemia in the periphery and within the soft tissues of the scrotal wall. Another patient with a late or missed testicular torsion, this was the left testicle, it's enlarged, it's very heterogeneous. Um, the heterogeneity reflects the vascular congestion, this focal increased echogenicity, the hemorrhage, um, that can also be associated with the infarcted testicle, hyperemia within the soft tissues of the scrotal wall and in the paratesticular soft tissues. So torsion of the appendix testis. This is um, an interesting diagnosis because this is actually the most common cause of acute scrotal pain in children. Um, accounts for about 35 to 67% of the cases. And the good news with this is that it's a self-limiting um, process. So, but what's more important is that you want to rule out acute testicular torsion or intermittent testicular torsion in, in the patients. But when you rule that diagnosis out, it's very helpful to actually provide the clinicians and the patients with a diagnosis or an etiology for why they're experiencing the pain and the um, symptoms that they're presenting with. So there are five appendages um, within the scrotal sac. The most common is the appendix testis, uh, and that actually accounts for about 92% of torsed uh, appendages. And then the appendix epididymis uh, accounts for about 7% of the other torsed appendages. And then there's three that um, I don't know that I would be able to identify, but they're known to exist. Uh, the blue dot sign is, has been described as clinically pathognomonic, um, and that's basically once this appendage um, becomes uh, tor ischemic, torus, ischemic, infarcted, it becomes sort of a sack of blood, and it has this bluish color to it with um, when they, the urologists shine a light. Um, but the problem is, that it, this is only identifiable in 21% of cases. So that doesn't make it too reliable. So these patients are generally always gonna come to ultrasound uh, for uh, evaluation. So there's a very um, specific appearance on grayscale uh, imaging and the torse appendage, the, the problem is it's not so much what it looks like, it's actually finding it. And in my experience, um, the technologist particularly in non-pediatric hospitals where I'm at, and I'm more a, at a university hospital, we now have a pediatric uh, hospital, but we don't have dedicated pediatric technologists. And that sometimes is the problem. You have to look for this. So where is it located? So if I go back to my diagram for one sec, the appendix testis, this is the um, a little schematic of the left testicle. And the appendix testis is generally seated medially. It kind of lives right here adjacent to the medial aspect of the kind of mid to upper pole of that testicle. And again, this is the more common appendage to torus, so we'll focus on this one for the moment. So in a transverse image of the right testicle and the left testicle, laterally we expect to see the epididymis. And this is an epididymal head, but it's very enlarged. And then there's another structure medially, and there's nothing that really should be living here. And you can see on the asymptomatic side, we don't see anything medial to the left testicle. So this has been likened to what they call the Mickey Mouse sign, and I'll show you it enlarged. So here's the upper pole of the right testicle, 
the edematous epididymal head, and then our uh, uh, torus appendix testis. Um, it's a an echogen when it becomes torus, it's an echogenic structure with these uh, central hypoechogenicities, uh, basically um, like clot formation within this uh, in this um, infarcted structure. This is another example of a torus appendix testis. Um, in this patient, we have the normal left testicle. We have an enlarged epididymal head here. And we have this extra structure. It sort of looks like it's an ovoid shaped structure. It has a retic reticulated type appearance. Um, it's really just clot, uh, in, uh, organizing clot within this uh, basically hemorrhagic infarcted uh, structure. We put color Doppler on and we see hyperemia within the testicle itself, the left testicle, and hyperemia of the epididymal head and no flow within this uh, torus appendix. So that makes sense, no flow. It's, um, the problem is that oftentimes this is not really um, identified or um, appreciated for what it is. What stands out more to the, uh, the sonographer and sometimes the radiologist is that there's significant hyperemia of the testicle and the epididymis, and then this gets misdiagnosed as epididymo orchitis. So that leads me in a second into my next slide. I also wanted to point out the reactive hydrocele, not uncommon, and then thickening of the tunica and the uh, scrotal skin thickening as well. So there's a lot of this torus um, structure kind of wreaks havoc um, within the scrotal sac for all these structures and hence causes pain. So let's take a look now at epididymitis. So this is actually relatively rare in pediatric patients in contrast to adults. Um, big range accounts can account for about 6 to 47 percent of cases of acute scrotal pain in children. Um, more common in the pubertal male than the prepubertal male. When it does occur in the prepubertal male, it's often associated with abnormalities of the GU tract. Um, for example, ectopic, um, an ectopic ureter draining into the vas deferens or seminal vesicles, bladder outward obstruction, or uh, reflux of infected urine into the ejaculatory ducts. Uh, the appearance of the epididymitis similar to adults and enlarged, um, diffuse enlargement of the epididymis. Uh, with heterogeneous echo texture reflecting, reflecting that edema, scrotal skin thickening. Um, again, you can find a reactive hydrocele and then um, significant hyperemia on uh, color Doppler interrogation. So I think you can, you can appreciate why, this, um, why the hyperemia that we see with a torus appendix testes can be confused with epididymitis. Acute idiopathic scrotal edema is a relatively rare entity. Um, but it should be included in the differential diagnosis of the acute scrotum in the pediatric patient. Um, it, this is an entity that's actually more common in boys than adult males. Uh, and I'd say we see about two to three cases of this a year. So it's something to be familiar with. The etiology is unknown, but it's believed to be some type of allergic reaction. Again, um, good news is it's, it's self-limiting um, and the edema tends to resolve without any sequelae within about one to three days. The sonographic appearance is uh, pretty typical. Um, you'll see a lot of edema in the uh, scrotal skin and color Doppler shows uh, significant hyperemia associated with that edema. Um, here's another example, uh, significant scrotal skin thickening. We see this um, uh, heterogeneous appearance that correlates with the edema. And this, uh, these sort of radiating echogenic uh, linear structures um, has been described as the water fountain appearance. And when you put color Doppler on, some of that um, corresponds to actually uh, vessels edema, uh, related to the edema. Uh, let's talk about inguinal hernias for a minute. Uh, incarcerated inguinal hernia is um, another entity that can present with scrotal pain and swelling in children. Uh, hernias, inguinal hernias are relatively common in children with an incidence of about 0.8 to 4.4%. Premature babies um, have a higher incidence of inguinal hernias and a higher risk of incarceration. The indirect form of uh, inguinal hernias are more common in children. Uh, they're always associated with a patent process of vaginalis, and the right uh, inguinal region is uh, affected more commonly than the left, and that's because it's known that the right side closes after the left. Uh, this is an example of an inguinal hernia on the right side. We see the uh, bowel um, 
moving through that uh, patent process with the inguinal canal into the scrotal sac. Here's an example of an incarcerated inguinal hernia. Uh, again, the, um, we see the right inguinal region here. Bowel has uh, traversed that patent processus and is sort of trapped uh, here. And this is the incarcerated form. Here's the uh, upper pole of the uh, right testicle. The insistent spermatic cord hydrocele, um, I include this because um, occasionally these patients will present uh, with palpable swelling um, in the uh, inguinal and scrotal region. It's usually not painful. Um, this is secondary to loculated uh, fluid or loculated fluid collection along the spermatic cord, um, resulting from abnormal closure of the processus vaginalis. Um, ultrasound is very helpful in distinguishing these from hernias, lymphadenopathy, and extratesticular tumors. On ultrasound, these are very well demarcated, um, oval shaped, anechoic uh, avascular masses. Um, they are located superior to and separate from the testis and the epididymis. And there's, um, let me go back, there's often, so the reason that it has this very um, demarcated appearance is that, that the closure of the processes happens proximally here and distally in the uh, scrotal sac region. So the fluid collection is, um, is localized to that specific region. All right, now let's talk about some female uh, GU emergencies um, with the presentation of acute pelvic pain. Um, we'll focus on ovarian torsion, fallopian tube torsion, hemorrhagic cysts, adnexal dermoids, and hydromutual copus. So beginning with ovarian torsion, either uh, which is secondary to partial or complete rotation of the ovary on its vascular pedicle with uh, subsequent arterial obstruction. Classic presentation is acute pelvic pain, uh, often associated with nausea, vomiting, and even an elevated uh, white blood cell count. Ovarian torsion happens to be more common in adolescents and young women, but we do see it in, in children, um, pre-adolescents, uh, as well as young children and babies. So, the most common grayscale finding on ultrasound for ovarian torsion is ovarian enlargement. We'll also see uh, multiple uh, peripherally located cysts within the um, torsed ovary that's related to transudation of fluid into those follicles due to vascular congestion. The uh, affected ovary can also assume a midline location um, that occurs in about 50 to 70% of the cases Color Doppler um, will show, often show absence of flow. I wanna say this is not completely reliable. If you have an enlarged ovary that has these strange looking uh, follicles and there is some flow, you shouldn't be fooled. Um, there still could be an ovarian torsion. Here's an example. Um, this was a, I believe this was a five-year-old who presented with, uh, with pelvic pain. Uh, on ultrasound, we see the, this is a transverse image, midline, we see this strange, uh, the uterus, behind the uterus, we see this enlarged ovary, color Doppler shows no flow within that ovary, a lot of peripheral flow. We have these um, enlarged um, looking follicles. So this is a five-year-old, 6.4 cc's would be abnormal for a volume of a five-year-old, that's really more of a um, pubertal ovarian volume. And if you compare to the asymptomatic side in that same patient, you can see that that uh, left ovary, which was the asymptomatic, measured 2.2. And so an enlarged ovarian volume, no flow, strange looking follicles, uh, this would be consistent with ovarian torsion. Large adnexal cysts um, are associated with an increased incidence of torsion in patients, particularly when the size of those uh, cysts exceeds five centimeters. This is a patient who presented with right-sided pelvic pain. We see this large uh, right adnexal cyst measuring about six centimeters in diameter. When we look more closely at that right ovary, we see it's enlarged. The volume here is 77.7 cc's. That's about um, seven times what's the normal um, pubertal ovarian volume. We see these sort of unusual enlarged peripheral looking follicles. We actually saw the, um, the normal or the asymptomatic um, ovary 
the left ovary here with a volume of 8.7 cc. So we're talking close to um, sort of nine to 10 times the volume increase. Uh, this, and the, the fact that you can see these both so close, we, we see that this right ovary has kind of assumed a midline location. And when we put collar Doppler on, no flow. So this was an ovarian torsion associated with a large adnexal cyst. Hemorrhagic cysts um, are these complex cystic masses which can masquerade um, as uh, ovarian torsion because the patients will present, they can present with acute onset of severe pain. Uh, the hemorrhagic cysts often have this lacy um, reticular appearance. Again, this is really just related to the, the, the um, organizing blood uh, or the clotting blood. Uh, there may be septations within the hemorrhagic cyst, low-level internal echoes, a fluid debris level. These are all helpful clues that you're dealing with the hemorrhagic cyst. Um, in this patient, you can actually see the normal um, ovarian parenchyma uh, sort of in the upper pole of this uh, adnexal structure. Uh, color Doppler will not show any flow within the hemorrhagic cyst. Um, uh, fortunately, in this case, we can actually see normal flow within the normal ovarian parenchyma, so that helps rule out torsion. Collar Doppler um, spectral waveform analysis is also helpful in just confirming that this is intra-ovarian arterial flow. So fallopian tube torsion is um, an, another um, interesting diagnosis. It's a rare cause of acute pelvic pain in females, but it's definitely an entity um, that we want to be familiar with. Um, again, we see, we probably see this twice a year. The um, right tube tends to be affected more commonly than the left tube, and that's believed to be related to fixation of the left tube by the sigmoid colon and the mesentery, which limits excessive movement. The etiology for this fallopian tube torsion uh, is believed to be associated with paratubal cysts, which are more commonly found in pediatric patients. And if you look at this um, image uh, from a laparoscopic uh, examination, uh, we have the uterus here, and then we have the fallopian tube, you can actually see the twist of that tube. And this was a large paratubal cyst and the, that was causing the actual twist of the tube. And so what does this look like on ultrasound? So basically what you're really seeing is the, that large paratubal cyst. It sits in the cul-de-sac, um, right in the midline. And if you see that in a patient who is really is presenting with acute pain, um, this, you want to sort of consider this in your diagnosis or your differential diagnosis, not to be confused with an ovarian cyst. And that's often what happens, it gets dismissed as an ovarian cyst and the patient proceeds to um, continue to have pain. Um, this patient was having right-sided pain. Interestingly, we were able to see the right ovary. Um, so we knew this wasn't an ovarian torsion. And the patient, this was the uh, patient that you saw on the image above that the, the uh, surgeon took the patient to the OR and found that torus fallopian tube. Um, color Doppler showed no flow within that cystic structure. Now, this is another example of a patient who presented with uh, pelvic pain. Again, midline image, we see that there's this cystic structure in the pelvis. There's some free fluid in the pelvis. Um, as we look a little bit clo more closely, in this case, we saw this um, sort of donut-shaped structure um, not too far away from that cyst. This is actually the um, thick-walled um, edematous fallopian tube. Uh, and that's why you see a little bit of flow in there. Uh, that patient went on to the OR, and again, another fallopian tube torsion was identified. Uh, adnexal dermoids um, are the most common ovarian neoplasm in children. Almost all of them, fortunately, are benign, a very low rate of malignancy um, when they are teratomas. Uh, one third can present with symptoms, and that's usually abdominal pain related to hemorrhage and or torsion. Uh, on ultrasound, these are complex cystic masses, and the, the actual appearance will relate to the composition um, of that dermoid. So the fat being hyperechoic, there can be calcifications, there'll be uh, uh, anechogenicity related to the cystic areas. Uh, and these can hemorrhage, so they can be painful just from the hemorrhage, or they can actually cause torsion, torsion um, just as large uh, adnexal cysts will do. Uh, 
And then finally, the um, diagnosis of hematocolpus. Um, this is an important one to keep in mind. Um, we just actually, this is not, the patient I'm showing you is not the same patient, but I just saw one two days ago, and it reminded me of how, um, how common this is. Uh, it's the predominant pelvic mass in neonates and infants. Um, hemorrhage, uh, hemorrhagic material uh, is seen to fill a distended vagina um, and or uterus. Uh, the etiology is related to vaginal or vaginal uterine obstruction. There are two peaks for presentation. One is the neonate, um, and that's secondary to congenital vaginal or cervical atresia, uh, a transverse septum or imperforate membrane. Um, additionally, the cloacal malformations um, or your general sinuses can also um, result in hematocolpus. The second peak um, is early adolescence uh, with uh, secondary to the imperfect membrane or transverse vaginal septum. Uh, in the neonates, the clinical presentation is usually a palpable pelvic or abdominal mass. Um, in the adolescent, it's actually cyclic pelvic pain or acute onset pain, and that tends to be um, when we'll see them in the ED setting. Uh, there may be a pelvic mass, there may be a history of primary amenorrhea. On ultrasound, um, you'll see a tubular, complex, fluid-filled midline mass. Um, as we see here, this is the bladder, and then um, on the longitudinal image, just posterior to the bladder, you see this large distended um, structure with these homogeneous low-level echoes. This is actually the vagina and cervix filled with um, blood products. Uh, transverse image showing you the same distended uh, vaginal uh, and cervical regions. And if you look a little bit higher up, you'll see the, this is the uterus, and there's a little bit of distension of the, with fluid in the, um, the lower uterine segment. Um, the, uterus may, the uterine cavity may or may not be dilated, in this case, just a little bit. So in summary, what do we know? Well, we know that torsion of the testicular appendages is more common than acute testicular torsion and epididymitis in children. So you want to be thinking about this and looking for it um, when you do not find uh, tis acute testicular torsion. Partial and intermittent testicular torsion can be a challenging diagnosis. Make sure you look for the edematous spermaticord or the pseudomass um, and the whirlpool sign on color Doppler images. Testicular detorsion can be a difficult diagnosis. Look for asymmetric increased flow in the symptomatic testicle. For females, ovarian enlargement is the most common sonographic appearance of ovarian torsion. Um, in addition to the midline positioning of the affected ovary, peripheral enlarged follicles, and diminished or absent flow, although this can be less sensitive, so be careful of that. Fallopian tube torsion, look for the midline cystic structure in the cul-de-sac that should um, make you think about fallopian tube torsion, hemorrhagic cysts, which can clinically mimic ov ovarian torsion, and finally, hematocolpus, which can present as acute pelvic pain. And I believe that is it. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Pfefferman, for a really great talk. Um, I'd like to ask if you could stop sharing your screen and we will have Dr. Sheth uh, begin his presentation. Thank you so much again, Dr. Pfefferman. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, we're going to do a whirlwind tour of uh, benign pediatric bone lesions. Um, I will try to give you some pearls and things to remember, particularly for those of you who are, will be taking boards shortly. Um, just to be systematic about these, the important thing to remember is that most pediatric bone lesions are benign. Um, the location of the lesion is particularly important in refining your differential, and radiographs are often sufficient for diagnosis. So we'll try to systematically approach these. Um, the big things to really remember for these lesions as, uh, as I go through cases is that we'll talk about transition zones, uh, location of the lesion, uh, lesion matrix, and presence or absence of periosteal reaction. So here's our first case, which is a 15-year-old who presented with knee pain. Um, I hope you guys can appreciate the lesion. So in the distal femur, there's a lesion. Uh, the transition zone, I would say, is narrow uh, because it's pretty distinct where the lesion is. The location is metadiaphyseal, and it's in the cortex. You, you want to differentiate whether or not it's medullary cavity or if it's intracortical, and this looks like it's more cortical. The matrix looks fairly lucent, but you can clearly see that thick sclerotic rim around it, and its periosteal reaction is present, is not present. 
So this is a good classic example of a non-ossifying fibroma. We use that term or a fibrosanthoma, which is the more overarching term. Uh, NOFs um, are typically greater than two centimeters. Fibrous cortical defects are the smaller variants, which are less than two centimeters. These are the most common fibrous lesions of bone. Uh, they're typically asymptomatic, but they can present with pathologic fracture. And if they're larger than 3.3 centimeters or they're greater than 50% of the, the bone diameter, there's an increased risk. These are typically cortically based lesions, as I mentioned before, and they're usually metaphyseal. They can involve the diaphysis um, in, uh, in some cases. These are typically eccentric with a, loose, a uh, lucent matrix and a sclerotic rim, and they're narrow zone of transition. So this is just an MR appearance showing you um, that typically they tend to be T1 hypo intense with a dark rim. This image here is a fluid sensitive T, uh, uh, sequence. Um, I believe it's a T2 fat sat and it shows that it's T2 bright, um, but the dark rim again is present and there's variable enhancement associated with these lesions. So the main take homes for in terms of what to do with these lesions is that they typically will envelope in a course of two to four years. Most of them will not require treatment unless they are particularly large, in which case they would have an increased risk of fracture. So um, orthopedists would want to consider doing curatage with or without bone grafting. This is case number two. Uh, this is a 13 year old who presented with knee pain. Um, so going through systematically our approach again, the transition zone is narrow because it's a fairly distinct lesion. The location I would say is metadiaphyseal. Um, in this case, I don't think it's a cortical lesion. I think it's an intramedullary lesion, but it is expansile. And you can see that the cortex is thin. Um, the matrix consists of multiple locules, um, And you can see that it's kind of got a multi-cystic appearance and there's no periosteal reaction that I see with it. So this is a good look for a aneurysmal bone cyst. So these are primary or secondary uh, bone lesions that occur typically in children um, and there is a primary underlying lesion that's identified in approximately a third of cases. Typically, um, this is a giant cell tumor. And giant cell tumor is something that um, I'll mention, of course, uh, later in this talk. But um, a giant cell tumor is kind of a unique lesion in, um, in the pediatric population because um, it does actually require that the physis be closed. So giant cell tumors are typically things that would occur in older children, not in younger children. Um, and ABC typically has blood-filled cysts, and they're usually located about the knee. So our imaging findings on radiographs, it's typically expansile, it's typically multi-cystic, there is thinning of the peripheral cortex, and the location within the bone is usually metaphyseal or metadiaphyseal. Um, on MR, uh, it's uh, a nice modality to use because you can typically see the fluid fluid levels really well uh, related to the presence of blood products within. If, um, if there is an underlying lesion, you may actually see um, some solid component. And uh, the thing that is uh, interesting to note is that the, uh, the big differential that we consider when you see an ABC or something that looks like an ABC is um, the variant of osteosarcoma known as telangiectatic osteosarcoma. And in that case, you would expect to see soft tissue beyond the lesion, not necessarily um, something that's an intracortical, not something that's necessarily an intraosseous lesion. And so this is just a nice example of an MR showing you clearly the, um, the fluid fluid levels related to the ages of blood products. This was a ABC that was noted within the wrist. So these can develop pathologic fractures. So in the same context as uh, what we were talking about with, our, with fibers and with um, fibers anthomas is that um, they can be treated uh, with curatage with or without bone graft. Um, there is a recurrence rate of up to a third and there are alternative uh, therapies that can be done like radiotherapy or sclerosis. So this is a four-year-old who had knee pain, uh, just like uh, our other ones, but also with a fever. And you can see that there's a lucent lesion in the, uh, in the distal femoral metathesis with a narrow zone of transition. Again, um, it's in the medullary cavity. There's no periosteal reaction, but given the context that this patient was presenting with fever, um, the suspicion was uh, that this was uh, infectious in nature. And so an MR was done. You can see here on the left, there's a fluid sensitive sequence that shows that there's um, fluid within this, in the central portion of this lesion, there's a rim around the lesion and there's marrow edema about the, uh, the site of involvement. And on the contrast enhanced sequence on the right, there's a thick uh, enhancing rim. There's, enhan there's marrow edema that's enhancing as well. So this should alert you and make you suspicious that there is osteomyelitis 
Um, and the lesion that we're seeing is what's called a Brody's abscess. So Brody's abscess is a subacute abscess that's in the setting of osteomyelitis. The interesting thing to note is that osteomyelitis doesn't actually have to have occurred specifically in that area um, that because of the, uh, the presence of hematogenous infection that uh, you may get a subacute abscess in a different site. Uh, most cases are in children and young adults, but this can be in adults as well. Staph aureus is usually the most common pathogen, and these are typically about the mean. So these present as lucent lesions, usually within a metaphysis. Um, and on radiographs, they tend to have sclerotic rims, but this can be uh, obscured by the adjacent bone. On MR, there's typically um, a T2 hyperintense appearance. There's um, central edema, and then there's marrow edema at the periphery. Um, the rim is usually T1 and T2 hypointense, but it does typically have avid enhancement. So on radiographs, so uh, in terms of prognosis and treatment, uh, these are the challenging thing with these is that they can be indistinguishable from primary bone tumors in about a third of cases, in which case a uh, bone biopsy will be done. Um, if there is a characteristic appearance and clinical presentation, uh, typically IV antibiotics um, followed by oral antibiotics will be done. Um, and they may need surgery if there is some sort of sinus tract or if there's drainage into the joint space. So this is a 14 year old who had a knee injury. And if you appreciate in the medial femoral condyle, there's a, a subarticular lesion in the epiphysis uh, with a narrow zone of transition. It's lucent, it's got a sclerotic rim, uh, and this is actually a very characteristic location for this entity. So take that for what it's worth and think, and we'll move on to our next modality, which is the MR that was done. And you can see here that on the, um, the image at left, you can see that this lesion is T1 hypointense. And on the image on the right, there's a um, T2 bright rim at the base. And uh, it's fairly similar in signal to the uh, articular fluid. And that's an important distinguisher that we want to um, that we want to describe when talking about these lesions. So this is just an example of an osteochondral lesion. Um, some of the other terms used is osteochondritis dissecans um, or osteochondral defect. Um, these are not true lesions, but they are typically post-traumatic, either uh, repetitive microtrauma or, in some cases, uh, acute trauma. Um, these are commonly in males, 10 to 20 years old, and this is, as I mentioned, the most common location. This is a central aspect of the medial femoral condyle. Uh, less common locations um, that are uh, that we do encounter are the ankle, uh, specifically in the Taylor Dome, or in the elbow and the capitellum, and then there's some other rarer sites. On radiographs, these are typically well-defined lucent lesions. They're subchondral, and um, they do have a sclerotic rim. You want to look on radiographs if you can for loose intraarticular fragments, although these are better seen on MR, and that's typically the, um, the management is um, to do MR to look for uh, intraarticular fragments or other signs of instability. So um, other signs of instability include um, a T2 hyperintense rim. And it's important to note that the hyperintense rim should be fluid bright um, because often that can be, um, if there's T2 hyperintensity at the base of the lesion, it may just be marrow edema and not actually a rim of instability. Uh, another feature of instability that to look out for is a large cyst, so greater than five millimeters at the base of the lesion as that increases the risk that this will break off into the, um, into the joint space. And this is just an example of a radiograph showing a uh, osteochondral lesion of the medial Taylor dome. So if these are stable, uh, typically they're treated conservatively, but if they are unstable, uh, surgical management is, um, is used. So this is a case of a 14 year old and moving out of the knee. Uh, we, and this is a patient who had an injury to in the hand. Um, Nothing particularly acute in the hand, but there is a lesion in the index finger. And so I would describe this as a narrow zone of transition. There's, it's a medullary lesion. Um, it's probably metadiaphyseal as it's involving both of them. Um, the matrix is lucent, but it's got some uh, internal radiodense foci. And I think the notable thing is that there's some endosteal scalloping. So the cortex looks a little bit thin. It's not really thin, but it, it does look like there's an undulating contour. Um, there is no periosteal reaction associated with this. And so this is just a good example of an enchondroma. So these are benign cartilaginous neoplasms. There is a risk of malignant degeneration. Uh, the important differential to consider is low-grade chondrosarcoma. Uh, and I'll show a table later that um, highlights some of the differences in these entities. 
um, for board's purposes, remember that multiple enchondromas is um, known as LDA's disease, and if there is the presence of venous malformations, um, Nafushi syndrome. So this is an example of LDA's disease, just with multiple lesions, and um, they, uh, they frequently are located in the phalanges. So these are metaphyseal more commonly than diaphyseal. Um, if it is a lesion that looks like an enchondroma, but in the epiphysis, um, low-grade chondrosarcoma um, should be something that uh, you think about more strongly. Endosteal scalloping is a common feature. As I mentioned, um, there shouldn't be periosteal reaction. And this is just a high chart highlighting some of the differences. So as I mentioned, um, uh, the low-grade chondrosarcomas are typically more in the epiphysis. Um, Location-wise, hands and feet are more common for endchondromas versus chondrosarcomas tend to be more commonly in the uh, axial skeleton. And then a soft tissue mass should certainly make you worry that there's a low-grade chondrosarcoma. So if the imaging features are characteristic, there's no real treatment uh, indicated, but again, if there's a pathologic fracture, um, the fracture is managed and they may have curatage and grafting. This is a 17-year-old with some left arm pain. There's a lesion in the mid-humeral diaphysis. Uh, it's a narrow zone of transition. Uh, I would say it's diaphyseal. Um, and also, it's medullary and cortical, as it looks like uh, you can appreciate that the lesion is not only has a cortical defect, but there is some extension into the um, medullary cavity. It's lucent, and there is no periosteal reaction. So I would also use the buzzword that this uh, cortical lesion has a uh, beveled edge to it, which that buzzword should clue you into what this entity is. But this is Langerhans cell histiocytosis, which is the osseous form of which is known as uh, EG. Um, and in uh, LCH, uh, over two thirds of cases, um, there is isolated bone or lung involvement. So um, I'm sure in your thoracic lectures, you get uh, many talks on pulmonary LCH, but this is just an osseous form of LCH. EG is the most common form, um, but it uh, represents less than 1% of bone tumors. That being said, there are some very characteristic appearances that we describe and, um, and help us make this diagnosis. So often uh, LCH is seen in the skull or the pelvis, and you can see these um, beveled edge lesions in the, uh, this radiograph of the skull. Um, in the, in the uh, vertebrae, um, you can see vertebra plana, which is a, another characteristic finding. Um, one thing to note is that monostatic involvement is uh, more common than, uh, than polyostatic involvement. And here's an MR, it's just showing you an example of vertebra plana. Uh, typically, there's T1 hypo-intense signal and uh, pretty profound T2 hyper-intense signal, and there is avid enhancement of these lesions. Um, just knowing that they uh, typically have these characteristic findings, MR is something that can be used to look for lesions and you can use whole body uh, imaging. So many lesions will fibrose on their own in one to two years, um, but uh, if there is, if they uh, do persist, there are some other th therapies that can be used, including uh, steroids or chemotherapy. This is just an example of a 15-year-old uh, with a left knee pain. It's a little bit uh, obscured, but there's a lesion that is off of the fibular head. It's protruding. So I would say this is a narrow zone of transition. It's a metaphyseal lesion, um, and it's pedunculated. It's a lucent matrix, and there's no periosteal reaction. The fact that it's pedunculated should clue you into what um, this entity is. And this is an example of, and you can see on this MR that there's a pretty pronounced T2 uh, bright rim, which I would call a, um, a cap. And so this is an example of an osteochondroma. Um, there's a uh, cortical medullary continuity and it's capped by cartilage. So that's um, where this T2 brightness comes from is that it's related to the presence of physeal cartilage. And that'll become more apparent as I talk about um, imaging findings and when to worry in, uh, in pediatric patients um, about these lesions. So typically osteochondromas present between the ages of 10 to 35 years old um, when, a single, uh, when there's a, a single lesion, but if it's multiple hereditary oxyostoses or MHE, they often present um, in um, before puberty. So on radiographs, these typically are metaphyseal lesions. They're often pedunculated or sessile, which are the major variants of osteochondroma, and they generally point away from the joint. 
and on MR, um, T1, they tend to be uh, a continu and you'll appreciate continuity with the, um, the dark cortex and the bright fatty marrow. So it looks like bone, but it's protruding away from the, uh, the remainder of the osseous structures. And on T2, uh, the hyperintense cartilaginous cap is usually characteristic. Um, in adults, we typically use a number of two centimeters as the thickness of the cap. And beyond that, we worry that there's malignant degeneration. In kids, that, that number is not relevant um, because they still have uh, physio, they still have active cartilage and so the cap width does not make as much of a difference in terms of stratifying whether or not these are concerning. So the growth of the osteochondroma should stop when the patient's skeletally mature. If they continue to grow then you worry that there is malignant transformation. If there is uh, symptomatic presentation or there, if there's continued growth then these will be surgically resected otherwise these will be conservatively managed. This is an eight-year-old with a left arm injury. Um, and you can appreciate that there's a um, narrow zone of transition. There's a lucent lesion. It's metaphyseal. It's medullary. Um, you can see that the, it's clearly expansile. And there's some thinning of the cortex to the point that there's actually even a uh, disruption of the cortex. Um, there's a linear transverse internal density um, that some would say is a fragment that's fallen. And so that should, buzz, that should give you a buzzword to what you think this may be. And this is a unicameral bone cyst or a uh, fluid filled bone uh, lesion. It's most commonly it's in this site or in the proximal femur. Two thirds of them occur in childhood. Um, they are asymptomatic unless there is a pathologic fracture. So these typically have expansile um, metaphyseal lesions. They have thinning of the surrounding cortex um, that, as I described, the fallen fragment sign is usually the buzzword that we use when we're thinking about unicameral or bone cysts or salutary bone cysts. Um, and there typically is not periosteal reaction unless there is a healing fracture. Um, and on MR, these tend to be fluid filled. So they tend to be T1 hypo intense, T2 hyper intense, unless there's some hemorrhage, in which case the blood products will be concordant with the age of the hemorrhage and there is peripheral enhancement. So this is just an example in another site. Um, this is a calcaneal UBC. Um, fortunately, in this case, uh, we often have uh, lesions and pseudo lesions that we can see in the calcaneus. Um, but in this, in, uh, this case, though, we do have contralateral radiographs which show that there is a, um, a clear lesion on the left that's not present on the right. So again, and as with uh, some of the other lesions we've discussed, the treatment is really to focus on pathologic fractures. Um, just getting, getting through the last few cases, this is a three-year-old with left arm pain. This is a narrow zone of transition. It's diaphyseal, it's medullary. The buzzwords I would use for this lesion are that there's ground glass internal matrix, um, and then there's no periosteal reaction associated with this. So this is a good look for fibrous dysplasia. Um, monostatic involvement is more common than polyostatic. And um, if you're trying to remember syndromes, remember um, the triad of polyastatic fibrous dysplasia with cafe au lait spots and precocious puberty refers to McCune Albright syndrome. Um, fibrous dysplasia with the presence of soft tissue myxomas makes you think of Mazabrod syndrome. So this is just a radiograph showing you a classic appearance of uh, shepherd crook deformity, which is uh, fibrous dysplasia involving the proximal femur. Um, the other buzzword that we tend to use is um, leonine facies, which are for fibrous dysplasia lesions within the skull. Classically, these are um, lytic lesions, the ground glass matrix, and they tend to be metaphyseal or diaphyseal. Um, one important thing to take home to, uh, just to keep in mind is that um, if you do see a fibrous dysplasia-like lesion in the tibia, um, adamantinoma is, a, uh, is, something, is something that should be under differential. This is just a MR showing you uh, some of the variability of the appearance, but like some of the other lesions we've talked about, these, these tend to be T1 hypo-intense and T2 hyper-intense. So these can get pathologic fractures and fractures can be treated as needed, um, but they may need surgery to stabilize larger lesions and prevent the risk of, uh, of a pathologic fracture. So this is a five-year-old who had left leg pain that's worse at night. Um, it's a little bit tough to appreciate, but there's a lesion in the proximal femur. 
So I would say that there's a narrow zone of transition because there's a lesion there, even though it's not the most obvious lesion. It's pretty distinct where exactly it is. It's, it's intracortical. Um, there's, it's uh, diaphyseal. It's loosened with a sclerotic rim. And that'll become more apparent as we proceed to different imaging modalities. And there's no periosteal reaction that I see with it. So this is a study that was followed then with a bone scan. And if you appreciate in the left femur here, there's focal uptake associated with the lesion. And so the CT was done and you can see that there's an intracortical lucent lesion with a sclerotic rim about it. And with that story of the pain that's worse at night, this is a classic example of an osteoid osteoma. So this is a lucent lesion um, surrounded by sclerosis and edema and it's usually intracortical. They're often in the femur or the tibia. And that classic story is pain worse at night and that it's uh, relieved by aspirin. So the lucent lesion is the actual osteoidosteoma and the sclerosis is the reactive changes within the bone that occur about it. So um, osteoblasts are noted within the central portion of the lesion. Um, most of the meds I mentioned are intracortical. Um, on CT, you may be able to appreciate some central calcification of the nidus, but typically the nidus is, is more lucent and the rim is sclerotic. On MR, uh, you may be able to characterize the enhancement, and these typically avidly arterial enhanced, though there is certainly some variability to it. Um, a related entity is osteoblastoma, which is the same histologic lesion, but it's a larger lesion. It's greater than two centimeters. Um, osteoblastoma, by comparison, has a nidus of less than two centimeters. Um, typically, these have no malignant potential. There's uh, a multitude of treatment options. Um, RF ablation is an option. Um, in the past, surgical resection was done. Uh, some of the emerging treatments would be um, HIFU is an option for, uh, for treatment in the pediatric population as well as in adults as, um, as, a, uh, as a new therapeutic method. And this is our last case, but this is a 16-year-old male who's got right knee pain. And you can see that there's a pretty distinct lucent lesion in the, um, in the medial proximal tibia. It's in the epiphysis. Um, there is some involvement of the metaphysis, but primarily I would say it's epiphyseal. There's a narrow zone of transition. It's lucent. It's got some internal sort of ground glass hazy foci, and there's no periosteal reaction. So this is an example of a chondroblastoma. Um, so this is a lucent lesion predominantly in children consisting of uh, immature cartilage cells. It's usually in kids who are 5 to 25. Um, it's typically in tubular bones. It's one of the few lesions that's most commonly epiphyseal. And so um, epiphyseal lesions don't really have as broad of a differential as some of the other topics that we've discussed uh, today. Um, so epiphyseal lesions, really the big things that you'd be thinking about would be um, a uh, giant cell tumor, um, if there's a closed physis, um, a chondroblastoma, or uh, a clear cell chondrosarcoma. So on MR, this typically has uh, intermediate T1 signal. There's heterogeneous T2 signal. And um, there's a T1 and T2 hyper -intense, hypo intense rim, sorry, and variable internal enhancement. So as I mentioned, the differential that you should consider for a lucent epiphyseal lesion would be a giant cell tumor, which has to have a closed physis, um, a chondroblastoma, or a clear cell chondrosarcoma if they are older. So chondroblastomas can get secondary ABCs, um, and we talked about before that ABCs have second, have, are secondary in a third of cases, but um, conversely, a third of cases of chondroblastoma can get a secondary ABC. Um, these are treated with curatage and or bone graft, but recurrence is common. And so just a few um, examples, just a few questions to kind of drive home some of the take home points. So in terms of which of the following benign lesions is characterized by multiple fluid levels, osteoidosteoma, ABC, a UBC, or chondroblastoma. And remember we talked about that aneurysmal bone cysts are the ones that have those fluid fluid levels that are clearly seen on MR. Which of the following is least likely to occur in a five-year-old male, uh, NOF, enchondroma, ABC, or a giant cell tumor? Uh, remember that giant cell tumors are have the uh, exclusion criteria that they have to have a closed physis, so that's the least likely to occur in a five-year-old male. And for this radiograph, which is the most likely diagnosis, you can see it's an epiphyseal lesion, so that off the bat eliminates really three of these possibilities, and so this is the case of a chondroblastoma. All right, thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much, Dr. Shett. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Pfefferman. Uh, and thank you for all who attended today. Um, we'll join you next week for our last week of the APDR uh, National Virtual New Conference Series. Uh, have a great weekend and be well.